No further ado, I want to uh, uh, first introduce just the moderator for today's panel. Um, Alberto Polito is the chair of our Department of uh, Ethnic Studies here on campus. Dr. Polito uh, studied at the uh, University of California San Diego and, uh, and the University of Notre Dame receiving degrees in sociology and Chicano and Chicana studies. He has spent his career examining the sacred uh, and the religious in the lives of U.S. Latinos and Chicanos um, through a historical and sociological lens. He's published extensively in these areas with a focus on the intersections of race, religion, and community expressions. He's the author of the book, The Sacred World of the uh, Penit uh, uh, Penitents, and has a forthcoming book on the life and career of the first Mexican-American sociologist, sociologist in the United States, uh, Julian Zamora, uh, which is entitled Moving Beyond Borders. It is, uh, it, it'll be published uh, later this year by University of Illinois Press. And the most important thing about uh, Alberto, Lopez Portillo, uh, Alberto Lopez uh, Polido is that he is here with us at the University of San Diego, uh, our very uh, 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 respected and distinguished chair of the Department of Ethnic Studies, the new Department of Ethnic Studies here at the University of San Diego. And it's, it's a wonderful pleasure to have him moderating the panel. Thank you, Thank you so much, Thank Alberto. You, David. Wow, that was very nice. <laughs> Boy, I didn't expect that kind of an introduction. That was very nice. Um, let me go ahead and uh, open up this panel entitled Migration, Religion, and National Identity. And um, as you are aware, we're late. I apologize for that, but I'm sure there's been good energy and good conversation going on. And I've been told that there are numerous students here that have to get a class, have to get to a class um, a little bit after 12, so please feel free to uh, excuse yourself, and again, our apologies that we are running late. Uh, I am uh, asking that the panelists spend 10 to 15 minutes in their remarks, and I will do my best to um, bring closure to this as quickly as possible. Uh, and um, I've been asked to make a few comments in the end. Uh, I may or may not, just depending on, on how our, our schedule is running. It's a real pleasure to uh, 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 share the uh, stage here with some distinguished folks. Let me just quickly mention them, and I, I'm trying to see who, how we're set up here. Uh, would you folks mind if we just kind of present it the way we're set up? Would that be okay? Because we haven't even talked. But so let me go ahead and begin here to my immediate right. Um, we have uh, Perette Hondagnew Sotelo, and she is the professor and director of graduate studies in the Department of Sociology at the University of Southern California. Uh, she's the author of um, seven books, and the most recent entitled uh, God's Heart Has No Borders, uh, How Religious Activists Are Working for Immigrant Rights, and it's published by UC Press. I, I personally would like to put a plug in for the book because I'm using it in my class, and it's an excellent project, so I highly recommend it. Um, Jose Maria Roman Portas is following. Uh, he's the founder and general director of the Fundación Ciudadanía y Valores in Spain. I'm not sure where in Spain, I'm sorry. In Madrid. Gracias, in Madrid, Spain. Uh, that offers uh, intellectual reflection on human rights. And then I have uh, Sarah Azernowski, who is a postdoc here at USD uh, in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, and she received her PhD in Theology and Ethics from the University of Virginia in 2007, uh, where she examined the uh, intellectual vision of Polly Murray, uh, Mur Mur Murray through her dissertation entitled The Dream is Freedom, uh, Paula Murray, Murray, it's Murray, right? And American Democratic Faith. And then finally, we have uh, Victor Carmona, who is working towards his PhD in moral theology at the University of Notre Dame. And amongst his many accomplishments, he's most proud of having worked with the US and Mexican bishops in the process that culminated towards the joint pastoral letter on migration entitled Strangers No Longer Together on the Journey of Hope. So again, I'd like to welcome you all here, and I will go ahead and turn over the uh, microphone to Professor Sotelo. All right, thank you. 
uh, thank you for, uh, to the organizers for uh, organizing this event for all of us, and thank you, Professor Pulido, for the nice introduction. I'll, I'll do my best to abide by the 10 or 15 minute rule. Um, so I'm going to tell the story today of what um, religious people are doing for the project of immigrant integration, inclusion, immigrant rights. It's a simple story, and I think it's one that's really not very well known in this country, although it's very dynamic. There are many participants in this story right here in, in this room and at this university. Um, we all know it's the age of international migration, but it's also the age of very hardened xenophobic times where a really new kind of nationalism um, and really a racialized nativism prevails um, in the United States. Uh, economic globalization, uh, the demographic switch of origins from Europe to Asia and Latin America, and certainly um, the post 9-11 threats of terrorism have, have led many Americans um, to be very fear, fearful of others and of difference um, and fearful of immigrants. And so the result is, I think as we saw in Wayne Cornelius's presentation, a, really a, kind of a lack of reasoned debate. And instead we get a lot of reactive, symbolic efforts to build up a wall, um, the ice raids, um, and et cetera. Um, and now more recently, of course, a lot of local and municipal efforts um, at what uh, the legal scholar Michael Olivas has called the return of the pigtail ordinances, right? Um, cities, again, trying to uh, control particularly targeted immigrant groups. So who is challenging this? That's what I'm gonna talk about today. And um, since um, this is turning into a little shameless show and tell, here's my new book, <laughs> too, um, God's Heart Has No Borders. Um, where I look in particular at the religious sector of the immigrant rights movement in the United States. And as I see it, these are activists of historical importance, and I think we may look back on them in the same way we might look at civil rights activists of the 50s and 60s, or at uh, Christian abolitionists. Um, not as perfect heroes, but as courageous pathbreakers in this particular moment of, of racialized nativism and nationalism that prevails. Now, the immigrant rights movement got a lot of play in the spring of 2006, when the big marches took form in cities um, all across um, the land. Um, but it really doesn't have a lot of full legitimacy. It's been growing since the 1980s, and although we can see there's 19th century precedents as well. And lately, it really seems to be in the shadow um, of our, you know, this whole economic meltdown and certainly in the presidential campaigns, both McCain and Obama stayed, you know, were pretty, uh, stayed quite a distance from immigration reform and of course McCain had embraced bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform until he became a political candidate for the highest office. So um, it gives you a sense of what a hot potato immigration is. But the, I think the religious sector is really leading um, on a lot of these issues. As I see it, the activists um, that I studied are really trying to change social structures that mandate exclusions and partial inclusions. Many of them are involved also in social service work in charitable efforts. Um, but they're really social change activists. And so these are instances where religion is public and disruptive. I believe even if they're using quiet um, professional methods of uh, political engagement, like press conferences, public forums, town hall meetings, it's still disrupting the status quo. Um, and fundamentally, they're challenging who can belong to the nation. Sounds like a simple question. Um, can Muslim American is immigrants be both Muslim and Americans? Again, it sounds so simple, right? In the West Coast, we're used to hearing Mexican Americans. In fact, that might not be seen as, uh, but um, it, is, it is a profound um, um, uh, and difficult to achieve goal. 
So I look at three uh, different sites in this book of organizing. Certainly, uh, legalization continues to be a big linchpin in, in immigrant rights. Uh, but in this book, I also consider economic rights, border rights, and civil rights and civil liberties. Uh, the case of civil liberties I look at through the lens of Muslim American organizations organizing after 9-11. Um, the case of border violence and deaths I take up with um, the uh, Posadas Sin Fronteras that happens here annually. And the case of economic injustice and exploitation I look at through the lens of interfaith worker justice, a group located in Chicago, and CLU, Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice, and I understand some of the people on the program are also uh, organized and in, uh, involved in the statewide effort there. So, how are these religious people um, you know, trying to achieve immigrant inclusion? And, um, and how are they using religion? Now, religion gets used in this big monolithic way. But religion, you know, we could break it down into various elements. And I, I hate the word tools, but I'm going to use it as kind of a shorthand. There's really four religious tools that, as, as I see it, the religious activists can use. Um, one is um, religious faith serves as a moral blueprint for how to treat others. And Professor Cornelius just put up all of the uh, different quotes from um, the Bible, scripture we saw, uh, Deuteronomy, and um, other scriptures. Well, similarly, um, the other Abrahamic faiths also have scriptures, uh, so that um, Jewish, Christian, and Islamic scriptures all prescribe um, love for the stranger, charity for the less fortunate, hospitality for the stranger, so welcoming the alien, justice, sharing, uh, this idea of Christian kinship, Jewish righteousness, Muslim charity, and compassion for the four for the poor, pardon me, um, threads the scripture. So there's a lot of altruism, notions of sacrifice for others, and all of these are embedded in these metaphorical stories in the Quran, in the Bible, in the Torah. And these get used in very flexible ways by today's activists for immigrant rights. A second tool that they have at their disposal is that religion offers material and spiritual resources for activists. First of all, take a look at clergy. Clergy are just sort of naturally charismatic people, right? They're used to standing up in front of their flocks and preaching what is right and what is wrong. Um, they're not only good speakers, but they have access to resources like buildings, and if you're organizing meetings, they have access to congregational um, meeting halls, to chairs, uh, like real folding chairs and tables, um, fax machines, phones. And there's another resource that I would call spiritual tenacity that is really important if you're doing social movement organizing, because social movement organizers don't often achieve their goals in the first month or the first year or maybe even the first decade of doing their work. A third resource that religion offers is legitimacy. Um, as I said, immigration is a very, and, and immigration inclusion, immigrant rights is a very unpopular cause. We have a lot of, as educators, we have a lot of work to do uh, along, that, along those lines. And as I just said, uh, neither McCain nor Obama went very far in uh, you know, pursuing um, and, and really trying to uh, problem solve immigrant integration and inclusion. So in an era when immigrants can be dehumanized as, we, we have these new nouns in English now. We have the illegals and we have the terrorists. These are words that didn't exist um, as nouns um, in, in, in the popular vernacular this way before. So religious leaders have um, you know, the legitimacy um, to speak up on these issues. They have a kind of legitimacy um, that uh, endows them in a way that our political leaders don't have. And fourthly, religion offers ritual and shared cultural practices that gets used by religious social movement um, leaders. So songs, symbols, scriptures unify and keep people going. And um, a very old-fashioned notion of religion, but I think one that really resonates as well today, is that religion 
is sort of a bridge between our past and between our future. Religion helps uh, us invoke uh, ancestors of long ago, a connection, a chain, as, as one scholar called it, a chain to the past, and yet a connection to a more just future that religious beliefs are, are, are uh, going to, to help us bring about. So, very quickly, in five minutes, here are the people I studied um, in a real um, brief overview. I interviewed over 100 people, and um, as I said, there were these three sites. I studied Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice, a group founded in Los Angeles after the riots and civil rebellion of 1992, when a lot of downtown Los Angeles was really burned to the ground. So we see a lot of social movement groups, um, community groups, arising in, in the ashes. Clue is a multi-denominational and multi-racial group, largely of Christian and Jewish clergy, although they have incorporated more Muslims since um, 1992. And they seek to promote economic justice. They work very closely with the new labor movements, which is one of our um, speakers um, last night noted. Uh, have also embraced the project of, of immigration reform. Um, how do they do this? They do this through home visits to union uh, leaders or, or workers, to workplace visits, and through protest. Um, they offer spiritual support and strength uh, to workers, and in Los Angeles, and in San Diego, and in Chicago, and in New York, and all the other places where similar groups are taking hold, many of the newly unionized service union workers, as is featured in the work of Professor Belinda Lam, are new uh, immigrant uh, workers, largely Latino, also Asian American workers. Um, Clue members, as I said, were largely Christian and Jewish, so they use religious ritual and scripture very freely. For example, uh, you have to read the book to get all the ethnography, but down Rodeo Drive, which everybody recognizes, Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills, in a, a big struggle to win union contracts, they organized massive uh, Passover Holy Week uh, marches, right, where 150 clergy, multi-denominational, showed up in full religious regalia, playing song, you know, uh, guitar, singing songs, and marching around to different hotels, rewarding the good hotels that had signed uh, just contracts with the unions, rewarding them with milk and honey, and punishing the bad hotels um, with bitter herbs. So Clue, you get it, is very mediagenic, right? I mean, if you were a reporter, right, for the LA Times and New York Times, you would want to be out there covering this and getting that message across. And they've been enormously successful. Yet, um, religion is certainly not a hoax here. Clergy really do feel spiritually renewed in the process. And as I said, religion, pardon me, uh, faith is what you do. And this is what they do to express their faith. The case of the Muslims I, uh, is important to cover. I studied organizations like Muslim Public Affairs Council, which has offices in Los Angeles and Washington, DC. The Council on American Islamic Re Relations, which has offices all over the country, and the South Asian um, Network. Most of these organizations were founded in the late 1980s. They're religiously identified organizations for civil rights and for the integration of Muslims into US society. In the post 9-11 era, they were really thrown into high gear, uh, defending and proactively promoting a self-definition as Muslim Americans. This led to many Know Your Rights campaigns that were geared towards their own communities, and many Know Your Neighbor campaigns that were geared towards interfaith groups and the public at large. It's a huge movement since 9-11. We've seen in places like Los Angeles, Detroit, New York, a huge moment of new coalition building. So these new Muslim groups in Orange County and Los Angeles County, where I studied them, have made new uh, alliances with groups like CHIRLA, the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights in Los Angeles, with the Nikkei groups, the Japanese groups who, who sought reparations for internment, and you can see the obvious linkages with the Japanese and the Muslim cases. And then also they have new alliances with Maldef, with the LC, uh, ACLU, and with black civil rights lawyers and religious leaders. 
At the same time, they have worked very closely with government agencies, the same government agencies that have been responsible for implementing a lot of very restrictive um, uh, policies on them. They've worked closely with the FBI, the sheriff's offices, what was the INS and is now the Department of Homeland Security, a prop alliances that are fraught with a lot of problems. But what I want to emphasize here is that Muslim American organizers have used a religion um, very sparingly in their organizing efforts. That is, they largely use secular, professional, institutional modes of politics. They never take out the Quran and say, uh, we deserve our rights not to be deported and hauled away in the middle of the night because it says so here in the Quran. They point to the American Constitution. They present themselves as moderate and mainstream. So they use institutional politics um, and yet they're pursuing, I think, a very, very profound struggle, a discursive struggle for self-identity to be um, Muslims and Americans. The last case that I will finish up with in one minute is one that's familiar to many of you here, and that's the Posada Sin Fronteras. And if you're not familiar with it, you can go on the third Saturday of December, and if Friendship Park is not there in 2009, we, or 2000, yes, yeah, 2009, um, there'll be another site. Um, this is a gathering of um, largely Christian people, Catholic and non-Catholic, um, who call for an end to death at the border through the performance of the posada, through a ritual, ritual reenactment. They use a, a liturgical calendar and Mexican Catholic religious ritual to call attention to this. They join forces with many others who provide water relief in the desert, shelters like the Scalabrini's provide, or um, the border angels, the uh, Samaritan patrol of, of border angels. Um, here. So um, I will end with that, and I um, uh, want to emphasize that uh, as a sociologist, I provide no predictions, but um, progressive religious people have already provided a, a very important role in um, the project of immigrant integration. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Uh, espero que el hecho de hacer la intervención en español pueda permitir a todos conocer la alta calidad de las instalaciones de este centro y comprobar la magnífica traducción que pueden ustedes disfrutar, para los que por lo menos no entiendan directamente el castellano. Y dicho esto, agradecer al, al Transborder Institute, a David Sir, el haberme invitado a participar en esta estupenda jornada. Alberto Pulido, su introducción, y dando por sentado mi agradecimiento también a todos ustedes que han querido venir a escucharnos, voy a poner, a entrar ya directamente en la intervención para procurar no agotar los justos minutos que, con los que debemos cumplir en la intervención. El, el texto lo tendrán ustedes seguramente disponible en, en la información que el Transporte Institute facilitará a todos sobre las jornadas. Voy a intentar ir dando las líneas principales de la, de la intervención, que en este caso trata de aportar a esta jornada una visión de cómo estamos percibiendo el problema de inmigración, religión en los países europeos o por lo menos en los países europeos occidentales y en el conjunto de la Unión Europea. Como todos ustedes saben, Europa hasta hace muy poco era un conjunto de países, un continente muy homogéneo en cuanto a sus estructuras sociales, políticas y religiosas. Y últimamente eh, el aumento de, la, de los flujos migratorios, especialmente en los países del sur, más cerca, ok, en, en los países del área mediterránea el incremento de los flujos migratorios es muy grande. Esto está llevando a una serie de conflictos, fundamentalmente eh, identidad nacional, eh, identidad cultural y de los países de origen. 
Y uno de los elementos claves es el tema religioso. La identidad religiosa, todos sabemos, es un factor muy importante en la vida diaria y la identidad cultural de cualquier colectivo, y efectivamente cualquier colectivo inmigrante. Y para las personas, si se encuentran en una situación, digamos, de indefensión o desarraigo. Hubo una intervención hace tiempo que era significativa, por lo que supone la persona que, que, a la que me refiero, que es el, el Papa, el anterior Papa Juan Pablo II, en un acto en la Catedral de Santiago de Compostela en el año 82, donde apelaba a las raíces de Europa. ¿no? A, a la, y él hablaba en aquel momento, yo obispo de Roma y pastor de la Iglesia Universal, desde Santiago te lanzo vieja Europa, un grito lleno de amor, vuelve a encontrarte, sé tú misma, descubre tus orígenes. Sí, reconstruye tu unidad en un clima de pleno respeto a las otras religiones y a las genuinas libertades. Esto era relevante porque era una llamada, en este caso por parte del Papa, a reconstruir la unidad, a reforzar las raíces en un clima de respeto a las demás religiones. Esto me parece que es un tema clave donde juega el, el, el equilibrio que se trata de buscar. En definitiva, el crecimiento de las minorías y la evolución de la cultura occidental, y especialmente en Europa, ha llevado a un secularismo de la sociedad muy importante. En este sentido, nos encontramos con que los grupos migratorios en Europa se encuentran con una doble crisis. Por un lado, la llamada crisis de valores, que ofrece unas brechas internas de la sociedad entre una dimensión, digamos, más religiosa y otra dimensión más laicista. Y luego la crisis que supone la inmigración entre la identidad del país de acogida y la identidad de los migrantes. ¿Cómo, cómo podemos armonizar esta situación? Pues realmente eh, se están llevando a cabo distintos intentos y distintas soluciones. En general, las minorías inmigrantes se encuentran con dos problemas. ¿no? Por un lado, su colisión con los valores cristianos y civiles, que básicamente eran los que conformaban las sociedades occidentales, y por otro lado, su propia crisis muchas veces con las estructuras seculares de la sociedad acogida, que chocan a veces con sus valores fuertemente religiosos eh, desde el punto de vista de la vivencia personal. En este punto, a veces... Estos inmigrantes se encontrarían más cercanos, digamos, a los valores cristianos de los países de acogida que a los valores del, del ámbito secular que están más o menos marcando las estructuras de los países en los que ellos llegan. Hay, por lo tanto, una doble crisis, la crisis de valores espirituales y laicistas y la crisis del país de acogida y los inmigrantes que llegan al país europeo. En este sentido... Básicamente, ¿cómo se pueden afrontar esta doble crisis? Pues pensaba que con una acción política y con una acción técnica. Desde el punto de vista, de la, de, por resumir los esquemas fundamentales sin entrar en otros detalles, desde el punto de vista técnico tendríamos que establecer tres criterios, que son los que están prevaleciendo fundamentalmente allí, en los países europeos, hablo fundamentalmente también de España, Francia, Italia… El primer criterio para afrontar esta colisión son los derechos humanos. Este es el, el, el punto de partida fundamental que se adopta como, como criterio, que permite ver en todo inmigrante, fundamentalmente no un inmigrante, sino una persona, un ser humano con todos los derechos que comporta su condición. Los derechos humanos se proclaman universales y, por lo tanto, entendemos que prevalecen frente a cualquier otra convención de los hombres, de los seres humanos. En España, por decir un ejemplo ya concreto, la, la ley de extranjería que regula los, los flujos migratorios configuraba los derechos fundamentales como límite a las manifestaciones de las convicciones religiosas o culturales. Los derechos humanos como, como primer criterio para avalar o limitar comportamientos. Esto es un constante, se está reformando esta legislación en España, por ejemplo, y dice que las normas relativas a los derechos fundamentales se interpretarán de conformidad con la Declaración Universal de Derechos Humanos y con los acuerdos internacionales. ¿no? Sin que pueda alegarse la profesión de creencias religiosas o convicciones ideológicas o culturales de signo diverso, 
para justificar la realización de actos o conductas contrarias a las mismas. Decir, primer criterio, los derechos humanos, los derechos fundamentales para admitir o no los comportamientos de las personas o de los grupos que llegan al país. Y también, lógicamente, para el tratamiento de esas personas, que incluyen los derechos humanos relativos a no discriminación, etc. El segundo criterio es el orden establecido. En la defensa de las identidades, el, cuando no entra en colisión ante un acto conflictivo, cuando no entra en colisión un derecho fundamental, un derecho humano de, los, de la Declaración de Derechos Humanos, prevalece el orden establecido que se entiende que es el que ha contribuido a diseñar una sociedad atractiva para los migrantes, para la gente que decide ahí, que decide eh, asumir los riesgos de viajar hacia, a ese nuevo país. Entendiendo como un valor eh, sobreentendido que los derechos humanos han estado en la base de la construcción de ese orden establecido también, o sea que si no, no podría, no podría llegar a ser. La Constitución española, por ejemplo, eh, dice que la dignidad de la persona, los derechos inviolables que le son inherentes, el libre desarrollo de la personalidad y el respeto a la ley y a los derechos de los demás son fundamento del orden político y de la paz social. Esto es un elemento fundamental. Y estos valores constitucionales, en ese sentido, pasan a formar parte de la identidad nacional y prevalecen frente a cualquier minoría. Es decir, que no cabe que nadie pueda alegar algo que vaya distinto a la libertad, al, al respeto a la ley, al respeto a los, derechos de los fun, a los derechos fundamentales de los demás. Y el tercer criterio es el pluralismo. Unas sociedades que han sido muy homogéneas, que en muchos casos, como ustedes saben bien, han sido países que tienen una religión oficial, una religión de Estado, una religión de Estado como Inglaterra o el Reino Unido, Suecia, Holanda... España hasta hace no muchos años y en algunas épocas de su historia, el pluralismo ha sido, es otro de los criterios fundamentales para poder utilizarlo como organización de la convivencia dentro del país. El pluralismo social es uno de los rasgos fundamentales de la definición del Estado como democrático, como aquí es muy bien conocido, pero siendo claro el pluralismo político Siendo claro, el pluralismo político y el pluralismo de las instituciones, el problema más difícil de analizar es cuando hablamos del pluralismo cultural, donde ya la cosa está menos reglada. ¿no? Muchas veces el pluralismo cultural es más difícil de separar del pluralismo religioso. Sabrán muy bien cómo parte de los conflictos en los que las sociedades europeas se han puesto a legislar y a, y a, y a intentar ordenar son problemas como el uso del pañuelo islámico eh, por parte de las mujeres, etc., ¿no? que ha creado conflictos de orden público. Eh, eh, en principio, dentro de ese pluralismo, se entiende que el, es aceptado que el centro escolar debe respetar los signos de identidad de los alumnos, en cualquier caso, siempre que no afecten al orden público. Esto ha sido... En este caso quedarían a salvo tanto los derechos culturales como los derechos religiosos, sabiendo que no colisionan con principios básicos de, de, de la organización política y social de, de cada país. Eh, dentro de lo que es la radicalidad de los planteamientos de, de un país europeo como es Francia, que muchos de ustedes conocerán bien, el gobierno francés hace unos años, cuando la, esta dimensión alcanzaba ya un, un tamaño realmente importante, decidió abordar el tema políticamente. Y, como saben, creó un consejo de laicidad para analizar hasta qué punto se estaban respetando los valores republicanos en ese país. El consejo de la laicidad emitió una serie de, de resoluciones, entre otras, aprobadas después por la Cámara y por el gobierno francés, se hizo prohibir el uso de signos religiosos ostensibles, en concreto el pañuelo islámico. Es cierto que esto lo hacía extensible a signos ostensibles judíos y a signos ostensibles cristianos, pero esto parecía que, además de enrarecer un poco el problema, no, no ofrecía soluciones prácticas. Estaba claro que había un problema de fondo, que era fundamentalmente el pañuelo islámico. En este sentido, en este caso, el gobierno francés eh, eh, pretende preservar frente al conflicto religioso lo que es la identidad nacional. 
en este punto el pluralismo ha quedado ahí un poco más eh, tocado y es uno de los temas que es más difícil de resolver. Por eso, al lado de estos criterios básicos, el, primero el derechos humanos, después el, la prevalencia del orden establecido cuando no entran en colisión los derechos humanos y salvaguardar en todo tiempo el pluralismo en todas sus dimensiones, político, social y cultural y religioso, Luego viene la acción política. O sea, acciones políticas para intentar resolver estos posibles conflictos. En la acción política es precisamente, después de los gobiernos anteriores, ahora la primera aportación del actual presidente francés, que es Mr. Eh, Sarkozy, donde ha lanzado la idea de la laicidad positiva como vía para intentar afrontar estas situaciones. En definitiva, eh, en este país donde desde el año 1905 había una legislación radical de separación y de no reconocimiento público de la, de la institución religiosa y de la dimensión religiosa, el presidente francés, eh, ahora citando discursos que él ha tenido recientemente, se ha llegado la hora de pasar a una laicidad positiva en la que las organizaciones religiosas y el Estado colaboren para solucionar los problemas cada uno con sus respectivos instrumentos. Es decir, está buscando cómo, dentro del Estado laico, la institución religiosa puede jugar un factor positivo a la hora de contribuir a la constitución de la sociedad política, de la, del bien común. Esto sería un cambio distinto entre lo que es este conflicto de valores entre dimensión espiritual y religiosa y valores y laicistas, por así decirlo. El presidente Sarkozy, por supuesto, quiere reconocer en este caso las raíces cristianas de Francia, pero dentro de este pluralismo cultural y religioso que hay que defender. Él mismo decía en una de sus declaraciones las raíces cristianas de Francia no impiden la vida en común con los musulmanes, igual que tampoco impiden escuchar a otras autoridades religiosas como el Dalai Lama, que nos ha enriquecido con sus reflexiones. Sí. Es un plano de debate conceptual. ¿no? Pero aquí hay una aportación muy importante, conscientes de que la dimensión ética y religiosa ¿no? permite dar una mayor comprensión de la persona en su totalidad. En, en Francia, por seguir el hilo argumental, después de esa resolución que hablábamos antes del Consejo de la Laicidad y del Gobierno de prohibir los signos ostensibles en las, en las escuelas, se ha dado el proceso de que la de, un incremento enorme de niñas musulmanas que se acogen en las escuelas católicas. Han dejado la escuela pública para asistir a la escuela católica, donde el hecho religioso es valorado positivamente y no encuentran dificultades para eh, manifestarse como son. Son dobles procesos que van ocurriendo donde se encuentran más acogidas y donde su comprensión como persona es mayor. La otra actividad política, aparte de este concepto, es buscar soluciones concretas. Aquí, en este caso... Ha hecho referencia la eh, ponente que me ha antecedido a, a instituciones que ya son de larga tradición en, en su país, en este país. Pero, fundamentalmente, yo diría que la actuación política en Europa ahora mismo está buscando dar visibilidad institucional al hecho religioso. Primero, por supuesto, estableciendo la igualdad de todas las instituciones religiosas y luego creando instrumentos de acogida y de integración. En Francia se creó por primera vez el Consejo Francés del Culto Musulmán para intentar dar organización y visibilidad a la dimensión religiosa de los musulmanes en Francia, que ya es una minoría muy importante, como ya conocen, no me voy a entretener porque me deben quedar un minuto prácticamente. Eh, otra solución política ha sido crear organismos políticos para dar interlocutores válidos al hecho inmigratorio y a la dimensión religiosa del hecho inmigratorio, y por seguir la línea argumental de Francia, pues la creación del Ministerio de Inmigración, Integración, Identidad Nacional y Codesarrollo. Es decir, la búsqueda de un ministerio que busca la, la integración, se ocupa de la inmigración, pero en plena igualdad con la identidad nacional. De hecho, el, entre las funciones del ministerio mmm, francés, Está el mm, aplicar políticas de educación, de lucha contra las discriminaciones, de integración, etc. Y, por otro lado, en la promoción de la ciudadanía, de los principios y de los valores de la República. O sea, 
es un ámbito que está luchando que sea constantemente parejo la defensa de la, de la integración. La inmigración, la integración y la identidad nacional están íntimamente relacionadas, decía el, el ministro francés. Paralelo a esto, dos cuestiones básicas. Bueno, en España, en otros países han ido creando los ministerios y las secretarías de inmigración. Está el contrato de inmigración. Se ha buscado una herramienta político-institucional que intente comprometer al inmigrante con los valores del país de acogida. En Francia está el contrato de inmigración, que lo, que lo ha puesto en vigor desde el año 2006, y al darse cuenta, que, y sobre todo después de los, de los disturbios que hubo hace dos años, hace tres veranos, eh, que no era suficiente con que el inmigrante sumiese, asumiese ese contrato de inmigración, ha creado ahora el contrato de acogida e integración para la familia. Es decir, toda la familia del inmigrante tiene que firmar ese contrato de inmigración. En España hay un, a modo experimental, sobre todo en la comunidad de Valencia, otro proceso que es voluntario, y es un proceso piloto, que es un compromiso de integración, en la que el inmigrante eh, es acogido, se dan todos los derechos políticos de la ciudadanía, pero a veces se compromete a incorporar la lengua, los valores ciudadanos, los derechos fundamentales, etc. Todo esto que está buscando en Europa, eh, la experiencia es intentar que no se consolide una especie de comunitarismo, a lo que en las sociedades homogéneas europeas hay mucho miedo. Eh, en principio, las ideas grupales, las ideas de grupo, las ideas comunitarias, no son bien recibidas y lo que se busca y se pretende evitar que sean fosos para la integración o que sean brechas importantes para la integración. Para resumir, tres ideas básicas. O sea, para lograr la plena integración de los inmigrantes es necesario atender la dimensión religiosa de la persona y de sus valores religiosos. Es un hecho experimental comprobado. El tratamiento que se le dé a religión por parte de los responsables políticos tiene que ser un elemento importante para facilitar la integración social. Y en este sentido, el, la propuesta de, diría yo aquí para avalarla de alguna manera, la propuesta del presidente francés de la Alicia Positiva, nos parece que es importante para, a la hora de marcar los nuevos rumbos que las políticas europeas tengan que seguir, a la hora de dar un hecho, de dar un reconocimiento positivo en la vida pública al hecho religioso, de tal manera que también dé más confianza a los inmigrantes a la hora de participar en la vida pública, social y, en este caso, también espiritual del país en donde han ido a vivir. Nada más. Muchas gracias. Um, good morning. I am, um, I am trained in religious studies and um, make that my disciplinary home. Um, but I will not be talking about religion today, but instead be using methodologies that are familiar to us in our hallway in Maher to talk specifically about U.S. border policy. Um, in particular, I'm going to offer a moral analysis of border policy strategy of prevention through deterrence. Um, I'm trained as an ethicist, and for ethicist, deterrence is, a, is an important category. It's a category that makes bells ring for us. Um, and it's a category that's typically used in two areas, in criminal law and in international relations. And when I began to look closely at border policy, what I noticed is that it really collapses a deterrence that belongs to law enforcement with the use of military technologies and force as a deterrent. And so this morning, what I want to do is just point briefly to some of the moral implications of a border policy that includes international deterrence, um, and then also conclude with a prescriptive recommendation for a shift in border policy toward a democratic and pan-American standpoint. Um, so here in San Diego, deterrence is evidence in the um, fortified steel wall that um, Professor Cornelius pointed to, if you were here for his presentation, um, that cuts a jagged path for 14 miles emerging out of the Pacific Ocean and into the foothills of the Laguna Mountains. The wall is a centerpiece of Operation Gatekeeper, which is a border policy um, initiative launched by President Clinton in 1994. Uh, to deter border crossers, Gatekeeper focuses technology, a majority of agents, and increased surveillance on urban corridors like San Diego. Um, so over the past 14 years, almost 15 years, Gatekeeper has been bolstered by a collection of federal laws 
um, and policies, but the emphasis on deterrence persists. That's the, the one thing that has defined border policy since 1994 and continues to. Um, a corollary of deterrence is that um, technology and manpower employed in urban areas will result in border crossers being, quote, forced over the more hostile terrain, end quote. That's U.S. border policy language um, of desert and mountains. So what this strategy assumes is that the natural barriers will deter border crossers and that those undeterred will be easier to apprehend. Um, neither assumption has proved to be correct, and Professor Cornelius offered extensive statistics about this. Um, and in fact, um, border crossing deaths have increased dramatically following the implementation of deterrence. So according to the U.S. government, the GAO, the Government Accounting Office, um, border crossing deaths doubled between 1995 and 2005, and Professor Cornelius reported to us this morning, he's my authority on these numbers, um, that since 1995, 5,000 people have died in the United States in the process of crossing the border. Now, just two weeks ago, the Associated Press reported that from October 2008 to March 31st, a couple weeks ago, that apprehensions are down 25%, but that border crossing deaths are up 7% over the same period from last year. Now, deadly outcomes of Gatekeeper have been charted by activists and political scientists and sociologists, among others, and while their accounts point to the failure of the policy to deter, none engages with a moral analysis of deterrence. And, and so that's what I want to start to do today. Um, so ostensibly, U.S. border policy depends on a theory of criminal deterrence that assumes that the threats of punishments and punishments themselves create effective behavioral incentives. And this kind of deterrence is the cornerstone of the U.S. legal system um, in which threats of incarceration and fines deter civil and criminal wrongdoing. And so in many ways, Gatekeeper is a classic example of criminal deterrence. It assumes that the increased likelihood of apprehension for unauthorized crossing in San Diego and the risk of death for crossing east of the city will deter people from committing what is a civil offense um, of crossing the border without proper papers and not at the proper place. But importantly, I think, border policy's deterrence includes also aspects of international deterrence, what can be described as the actions of governments to build up defenses in order to mitigate against foreign attack. And so in order to investigate how Gatekeeper includes aspects of international deterrence, we need to pay attention to the growing militarization of the border. And by militarization, I mean the increased use of strategies, materiel, and training that are sponsored by the military or are military in origin. So gatekeeper and current US border policy here in San Diego and all along the border employs technologies developed for military use, including magnetic ground sensors, infrared night vision scopes, unmanned aerial vehicles, as well as military issue helicopters and Humvees. Um, beginning in the 1990s, National Guard and Marines were periodically deployed to help patrol the border. In 2006, President Bush deployed 6,000 National Guard troops to the border in California, Arizona, and Texas. Um, border patrol and military troops are often indistinguishable. All wear, wep all wear uniforms, pardon me, carry weapons prominently, and can travel in Humvees. Um, President Obama so far has resisted governor's calls to deploy National Guard troops to the border, but his Southwest Border Security Initiative continues deterrence by sending more technology and agents to the border, and so far it has not addressed the risk that further border fortifications um, will increase border deaths. So gatekeeper's strategy of prevention through deterrence exceeds criminal deterrence because it employs military technologies and personnel to dissuade citizens of other countries from crossing the border. The targeting of unarmed civilians with military technologies and sometimes with personnel points to just war as a tradition of moral analysis to examine current border policy. Now, just war is a, is a collection of principles that addresses when it is justifiable to use military force and what limits and restrictions should govern the use of force. 
And so to investigate Gatekeeper with the ethical resources of just war, I argue, can help us to evaluate what is happening on the border. What's going on here? So central to just war is the principle of discrimination, which requires that military force target only those who aren't combatants, that unarmed civilians are immune from being targeted. Yet, U.S. border policy targets border crossers with military technology and has threatened them with military force. So people who cross the border without authorization, so people who are crossing not at the proper place and without the proper papers, are plainly not combatants. But, as we've talked about this morning already, according to dominant political rhetoric, they are not innocents either. Um, once a person crosses the border without authorization, she is always already illegal. A lawbreaker without any legal, or it would seem moral standing. And so what I want to do is look at political philosopher Michael Walzer's discussion of discrimination in his discussion of just war, and particularly his discussion of the moral equality of soldiers, to help us to figure out the constructed status of border crossers as no longer innocents. So for Walzer, the moral equality of soldiers is grounded in the fact that every soldier is a legitimate target of an opposing soldier because each has, quote, allowed himself to be made into a dangerous man, end quote. In so doing, and in the context of wartime, argues Walzer, the soldier consents to his status as no longer innocent. A soldier is a justifiable target of military force in large part because he has adopted self-consciously a particular moral status. A soldier has, to some extent, agreed to be the target of force. Border crossers have not done anything to allow themselves to be made into dangerous persons. They have not self-consciously adopted the moral status of dangerous people. Yet they are targeted by military technology and threatened with military force. So another discussion of Walzer's, which is right next to this discussion of um, the moral equality of soldiers, is his discussion of who qualifies as a non-combatant. And so I, wanna, I argue that this can address the moral status of people who cross the border not at the proper place and without the proper papers. So to talk about these people, who is a non-combatant, Walzer explains that, quote, the theoretical problem is not to describe how immunity is gained, but how it is lost. We are all immune to start with. Our right not to be attacked is a feature of normal human relationships. The right is lost by those who bear arms effectively because they pose a danger to other people. It is retained by those who don't bear arms at all." End quote. Now, border crossers do not bear arms, yet they are targeted. In some way, they have lost their immunity from being targets of military technology and the threat of force. So according to Gatekeeper and US border policy, committing a civil offense justifies that a border crosser be the object of prevention through deterrence. So the act of crossing the border not at the proper place and without the proper papers results, therefore, in the loss of a person's rights not to be targeted by military technology and personnel. By committing a civil offense, a border crosser has practically transformed herself into a dangerous person. So I want to be clear that my appeal to Walter in no way presumes that he would classify border crossers as dangerous or no longer innocent. Rather, I think that Walter's discussion of the moral status of non-combatants illuminates how current U.S. border policy collapses, a deterrence that belongs to um, law enforcement with the use of military technologies and force as a deterrent. So criminal deterrence depends on a particular, which is also semantically inappropriate and problematic, but just to talk about the assumption that the policy is using, right? So criminal deterrence depends on a particular set of fines and punishments to deter civil and criminal wrongdoing. But in an effort to deter people from crossing the border, Border policy uses military technologies to target unarmed civilians from neighboring and allied countries. So U.S. border policy treats border crossers as combatants. So the U.S. Constitution does indeed affirm the federal government's jurisdiction to enforce an admissions policy, but 
the means that the U.S. employs to patrol the border needs to take into account moral consensus that unarmed civilians should not be threatened with military force. U.S. border policy ought to abandon its nationalist and protectionist posture and adopt instead a democratic and pan-American standpoint, which would really be transformative of border policy, I think. A democratic border policy would prioritize human rights, which seems straightforward, but alas, is not what's happening right now, arguably. Um, emphasizing the values of human dignity and respect for all life, a democratic border policy recognizes that people who cross the border not at the proper place and without the proper papers are human beings who should not be driven into treacherous desert backcountry. While the international border is a political reality, U.S. border policy with a pan-American standpoint recognizes that nationalism works against cross-border relations. The United States shares with other Americans traditions of revolutionary struggle, democratic uprisings against oppressive ruling powers, as well as histories of conquest, slavery, expansion, and annexation. A pan-American border policy would seek to understand then the social, historic, and anthropological realities of the borderlands that straddle the international boundary between the U.S. and Mexico. And finally, a democratic and pan-American U.S. border policy could herald the United States as American, thus transforming its self-understanding and its relations to its neighbors. Thank you. Hi, good, uh, good afternoon. Let me begin by expressing my gratitude to the Transporter Institute and the Joan B. Kroc School of Peace Studies for their invitation. I came to this university seven or eight years ago looking for help from its students, professors, and administrators for the San Eugenio mission at the outskirts of Tijuana. The outpouring of support we received, particularly in time volunteered by undergraduates, nursing students, and others, made a significant difference in the lives of many there. The witness of the students in particular taught me that this is a very special place, so it's, it's very good to be back. Now, my introductory remarks address the ethical dimension of immigration and national identity from perspectives of my work in the pastoral, governmental, and nonprofit sectors, and from my studies in moral theology. Please bear in mind that some of the positions I'm going to comment on are summarized for the sake of brevity. When I graduated from college 10 years ago, I was offered a job at the Mexican Catholic Conference of Bishops. For two years, I traveled to cities along the U.S. and Mexico and Mexico-Guatemala borders to find out how the Catholic Church and other churches were serving the humanitarian needs of immigrants. Here's one ha what happened on one occasion during a site visit to the Mexican state of Tabasco. I was on a ride-along with Grupo Beta, a human rights enfor enforcement unit of Mexico's immigration authorities. We had been driving for several hours at night towards a remote spot along the Mexico-Guatemala border where thousands of undocumented immigrants cross under the cover of darkness each year. The pickup truck I was on came to a sudden stop at the foot of a railroad bridge. Out of the dark, a group of about 20 young men I could see that they were about my age, I was in my early, 20, early 20s then, came to meet us. They were hungry and thirsty, tired and dirty. They had been walking for several hours. It was damp and humid. Although I could barely make out their faces in the moonlight, I could smell their sweat. After we gave them water and talked for a bit, I asked them point blank, why are you doing this? Isn't this too dangerous? I asked them because I had read reports that, the, that bandits were assaulting immigrants in the area with machetes and that Mexican soldiers and police officers were stealing from them, sometimes going as far as committing rape. One of the immigrants looked, looked at me straight in the eye and simply answered, Hermano, si estuvieras en nuestra situación, harías lo mismo por tu familia. Brother, if you were in our shoes, you would do the same thing for your family. I've had similar conversations with undocumented Mexican immigrants in the U.S. Now, experiences like the previous one point to the moral dimension of the debate around immigration, border control, 
and the precarious situations of undocumented immigrants. Are the border enforcement strategies the U.S. and Mexican government using ethical? Are immigrants justified in breaking an immigration law? Are host communities morally, morally acting by not uh, granting these immigrants legal status? And what is just in such a complex situation? This last question is the main one talked about, even if implicitly, in the American public square. There, most of the positions I've come across can be traced either to a liberalism that emphasizes the moral worth of the individual over the community, or to a communitarianism that emphasizes the moral worth of the community over the individual. Although some institutional and individual actors take extreme positions that argue for either fully opened or sealed borders as a matter of justice, most people and institutions take positions that fall somewhere in between. But what of moral reasoning then from a faith perspective? I'd like to argue that participants in the public square should be able to address the moral dimension of the immigration debate using reasoning that is informed by faith perspectives, because doing so serves to identify problematic assumptions. And I'm going to offer three short examples as a case in point. The first one is a prevailing assumption about the meaning and consequence of poverty. Unfortunately, the young men I met next to that bridge didn't fall under either the categories of refugee or asylum seeker because they weren't fleeing immediate political conflict through war or persecution. Most ethical positions informed by secular thought and a few also informed by, by faith commitments makes a strong distinction between political and economic reasons for migrating. The argument goes usually something like this. There are economic immigrants and then there are political refugees. Economic immigrants are coming because they want a better, easier, and economically richer life, while refugees are escaping violent situations and simply sur seek survival. Therefore, refugees clearly have a higher moral claim than do immigrants. The reality of undocumented immigration in this hemisphere, though, is much more complex than that. Now, I don't want to deny the tragedies that cause refugee displacement, nor the suffering that refugees endure. However, I also don't want the suffering of those experiencing extreme economic violence to be diminished. Gustavo Gutierrez's liberation theology, for instance, sheds light on the meaning of poverty. It is premature death and as such, it is an evil that can't be ethically justified or ignored. From that perspective, the young men I met were, expecting, were escaping death and seeking survival for themselves and for their families. Farid Sakari also lays it out well for us. Quote, here poverty means a bad life, but poverty in the third world means death. For the one billion people who live on less than one dollar a day, one bad cold, one unlucky fall, one month of poor rainfall, and they or their children or both will, will surely die, close quote. Now, some are beginning to use the term economic refugees, and that is an important and necessary step to take. But it is also necessary to figure out what their moral standing is in relationship to economic immigrants and political refugees. A second example has to do with a common misconception about the way in which a person's undocumented status is experienced. It is likely that some of the men I met at that bridge already had families, family members living in the U.S. as citizens, permanent residents, or undocumented immigrants. The answer the young immigrant gave me illustrates how the family is an intrinsic aspect of their decision-making process. Many pastoral and nonprofit agents across the U.S. and Mexico know from experience that immigrant families have members with different legal situations. For instance, imagine a family of five. The father and the first child are undocumented immigrants, while the mother and the middle child are permanent residents, and the youngest child still is a US citizen because that child was born here. Now, in the public debate, however, the family as such is rarely given any direct moral standing because a moral agent in question is assumed to be a, 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 a relationless individual, a monad, who is here alone and is morally required to pay the price of breaking the law. 
It is well known that the U.S. Catholic bishops, as well as leaders of other Christian denominations, are very strong advocates of ensuring that immigration policies follow a fa principle of family unity that is based on their interpretation of natural law theory and or scripture. Even so, the debate in the public square takes it for granted that the sole subject requiring, mor requiring moral consideration is, in, is the undocumented immigrant, when in fact that isn't the case. Here's a third assumption. A third assumption regards national identity and assimilation. What happens to immigrants like the young men I met once they arrive into the US and live among us? What moral weight should the protection of American culture and way of life be given in immigration policies? Liberals argue that this should be less of a concern when compared with the moral worth of the immigrant, while communitarians argue that this is an essential consideration, otherwise the country will lose its character. Although American society self-identifies as multicultural, its experience with mestizaje or the mixing of races and cultures into new hybrid ones is relatively recent because anti-miscegenation statutes were common until the late 1960s. Among Mexican-American and other Latinos though, mestizaje is long-standing. Out of this experience, for example, Father Virgilio Elizondo has developed a Latino and Latina theology that finds in Our Lady of Guadalupe's mixing of the Spanish and native races, cultures, and religions a beautiful response to the violence and conquest of evangelization. In Our Lady of Guadalupe, Elizondo finds dignity and affirmation for a community that has experienced the pressures of assimilation into a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant understanding of national identity sometimes by the Catholic Church itself. An understanding which Samuel Huntington has articulated to a certain extent that takes a given culture and just one as normative for the American experience because of the notion that only that one culture provides the moral underpinnings for the American consensus around political unity and religious pluralism to thrive is laden with implicit ethical stances. True, the question of integration frankly, I prefer this term instead of assimilation because it seems less violent, is morally complex. But what I'd like to propose is that the theology of Elizondo and the experiences of Mexican Americans and hybrid Americans of mixed race or ethnicity begs the question of whether moral analyses revolving around the issue of integration are taking their experience of national identity and their sense about the present and future of the American consensus into consideration. From a faith perspective, perspective then, three problematic assumptions in the debate around immigration, border control, and the precarious situation of undocumented immigrants come to light. First, that poverty has no moral, we no moral weight when it does. Second, that families require no direct moral consideration when they do, regardless of the mixed legal statuses of their members. And third, that the complex moral questions surrounding integration into the American consensus of political unity and religious pluralism revolve around an abstract sense of multiculturalism, where as little attention is, is given to the experience of Americans of mixed race or ethnicity. In closing, perhaps it is fitting for us to remember that when the good Pope John XXIII wrote his letter on peace on earth, and in it set out to identify what is required from the relations between persons, their governments, and the international community for peace to exist, he included the experience of migration. Justice for immigrants is a key piece of the puzzle for peace. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to uh, all the panelists. We've got about five minutes, David, for questions and answers. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, what I find so fascinating in these conversations is the fact that um, people have always and will always engage religion in their lives. And what is important is that we acknowledge it and that we figure out a way to embrace and to build on that, on that idea. And that maybe through these types of um, conferences and conversations, we can articulate that in a way that we work together in terms of moving that agenda forward. Because I'm so struck by the fact that 
there are already people doing this work. It's just that we don't acknowledge it at many times. And, and I, I just, that's one of the things that struck me in terms of what was presented today. So I just uh, appreciate the panelists and bringing that to the forefront. So about five minutes for questions. A few questions, please. Yes, sir. Hold on one second for the mic. If, if the panel could also just repeat the question because the translator is not picking up the feed from this microphone that would help with the translation. Repeat the question? Yeah, if you could. Okay. Uh, first, a comment to uh, Dr. Azaransky. Uh, the current Border Patrol strategy um, says that the primary purpose of the Border Patrol is to interdict would be terrorists and it explicitly conflates the uh, the movement of undocumented migrants that may, as they say, provide cover for foreign terrorists. So in terms of your argument, it seems to me the court, current, uh, current policy uh, takes the whole difference that you establish using Walzer and erases it, uh, which is entirely problematic. Uh, to Dr. Uh, Sotella, I have a question. I wonder whether... Um, uh, there are other ways in which uh, r religions also uh, involve themselves. I'm thinking about the sanctuary movement and uh, also uh, the, the Archbishop of Los Angeles uh, uh, called while well, the Sensenbrenner uh, bill was before Congress that if it were to pass, um, he would encourage uh, the priest and the lady to commit civil disobedience. So are there other, other forms of engagement uh, beside the four you listed? Go ahead. Well, okay, I'll, uh, the second question came to me, I'll be brief. Um, the question for the translator is, um, are there other ways that uh, religious people are uh, involving themselves in these movements, such there is, after all, the sanctuary of the 1980s, and Cardinal Mahoney in Los Angeles was very outspoken against um, the Sesson Brenner Bill in 2006 and said um, clergy should, uh, you know, uh, commit acts of nonviolence and noncompliance. I, I, I look at some of those cases uh, in, in my book also, I'm, and some, there's other historical examples. Um, so. You know, I think it's really important. There's many different ways. And I think it's really one thing I do want to add that I um, uh, wasn't addressed here is that um, all of the mainline churches in this country, the hierarchy of all the mainline churches, have issued strong statements in favor of immigrant integration, human rights, social justice. Um, certainly, there's um, the, the Catholic bishops' pastoral letters um, that uh, Victor Carmona spoke of, and their, um, you know, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the, um, uh, not the Orthodox Jews, but the Reformed Jews have. So you could just go down the list. But when you look at what's going on in the pews, there is a big disconnect. So, I mean, that's a whole other area for cultivation, I think. Um, for religious um, leaders to focus on this disconnect. Thank you. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'll I'll respond. Yeah, sure. Um, that you were saying that current um, that the that the border patrol understands that it is trying to interdict terrorists, and so completely collapses this distinction I'm making between. Uh, criminal deterrence and international deterrence. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think what happens, um, uh, a significant but quiet thing that happened in federal government in 2003 related to border policy was that um, border patrol and immigration used to be in the Department of Justice and it shifted to the Department of Homeland Security, whose mission it is to protect the United States from those who would threaten the American way of life, quote unquote. So uh, that's problematic. And yet, what is tricky in all this is that the United States still professes to not be engaged in an international conflict on the border as much as it's militarized. It still understands what it's doing as an issue of law enforcement and it professes to be law enforcement even as they have deployed troops and may in the future and are certainly deploying military technology. 
And there are people, um, Peter Andreas is one who has a great book called Border Games, and Tim Timothy Dunn is someone else who makes the argument that what's happening on the border, and has been since the 90s, is in fact a low-intensity conflict. And so that really we need, so for me as an ethicist, I want to be taking you know, categories of moral analysis that deal with not just criminal deterrence, but also uh, war to say that if this is a low intensity conflict, that's what we need to be thinking with. So I agree with you that it collapses, and yet the language of the policy from 1994 that is extant is very much seems to be on its face criminal deterrence. And I want to say, well, it's both. Are there international laws that are specific to the protection of, of human rights of migrants? Except, have they been established clearly by the United Nations? Or by so the question is if there are <laughs> international laws with regards to migrants. Que si hay leyes internacionales para los derechos humanos de migrantes. Y por supuesto, hay hay la Incluso hay un departamento de las Naciones Unidas dentro de la OIT, de la Organización Internacional del Trabajo, que es el secretario para la Migración Internacional, con sede en Ginebra, que se dedica todo el tiempo a la problemática de la migración, a la defensa de los derechos humanos en todo lo que es el, la política internacional, y, y bueno, la política internacional aplicada directamente a la migración, con especial relieve también en todo lo que es la contratación de los trabajadores en los países de origen para asegurar lo que son los derechos laborales. Y hay, dis y hay distintas convenciones internacionales habladas por tanto por las Naciones Unidas directamente por la Organización Internacional del Trabajo relativo al, al hecho de la migración. Quizás, quizás la sede por la que la institución o la Organización de los Derechos de las Naciones Unidas está en la Organización Internacional del Trabajo es porque el, el primer enfoque de la migración a nivel internacional fue como fuerza laboral, aunque haya ahora otros motivos lógicamente que están dando lugar a los movimientos migratorios. We have time for one more question. question. Gentleman here. Thank you. Eh, thank you. La pregunta sería para el señor Portas. Eh, me gustaría saber si en España uh, de qué manera ha afectado estas nuevas minorías que han llegado del sur a lo que por muchos años parecía como una sociedad española fragmentada. Eh, gallegos, asturianos este, de Barcelona, los, eh, etcétera, y especialmente pensando en los grupos de, de el ETA, de todo lo que es la, las vascongadas. Si, ¿Cómo ha afectado la identidad? Es, eh, me intrigaría saber si ha unificado la unidad o dentro de España como identidad, o si estos grupos todavía se mantienen marginados. The question is uh, the impact of new migration coming into Spain and how it's affected culturally. La inmigración en España, en mi opinión, todavía no ha afectado al hecho de la identidad nacional. Y básicamente, sí está afectando a la organización social, política y económica en la medida en que los inmigrantes en España, desde el primer momento en que llegan y empiezan a realizar su función, adquieren todos los derechos de la ciudadanía. Y, en este sentido, las tensiones que se generan son por la utilización de los servicios públicos y sociales, la educación, la sanidad, los servicios para los mayores, los elders, donde a veces sí que han entrado en conflicto con la eh, población local, pero no ha afectado lo que es a la estructura social. Ha generado alguna tensión política en la medida en que la política migratoria es responsabilidad del gobierno español, mientras que la gestión 
de los servicios eh, sociales forma parte de las regiones de España. Y ahí se generan tensiones porque la inmigración no se distribuye igual, lo mismo que ocurre en Estados Unidos, no se eh, distribuye igual por todo, el, por, toda la comun por todo el país, por todo el Estado español. ¿no? Entonces, las regiones que tienen más presión inmigratoria tienen más problemas generales. De todas formas, estamos en un punto ahora mismo de crisis o de, de reenfoque por la crisis económica. La crisis económica está suponiendo que haya crisis laboral y empieza a haber en algunos aspectos enfrentamientos, eh, quiebra de la cohesión social a la hora de disputar un puesto de trabajo. España, lamentablemente, en este momento es el país con mayor paro laboral de toda la Unión Europea eh, y está la economía, digamos, en, en una crisis fuerte y esto por primera vez, por primera vez empieza a suponer alguna crisis, digamos, un poquito importante a la hora de la, de la, de la integración de los inmigrantes. Pero no ha afectado todavía la identidad en general de lo que es el Estado español. Well, thank you very much again. Can we give a round of applause to our panelists? Thank you for attending, and Dr. Shirk, I'm sure, will follow us with the next set of directions. Chris, I, I do want to thank Alberto and, and the panelists for basically bringing us back on schedule after the disastrous performance of our morning moderator uh, in, in terms of time schedule. I, I will point uh, out that uh, we do have a luncheon keynote speaker that we've anticipated, and, and those of you who registered for the lunch, uh, uh, I'll ask you to proceed through these doors. There are uh, that, that lunch will take place in conference rooms A through D. Uh, we do have. I think a couple of slots available. For if, if you didn't happen to register for the lunch, um, please check with our attendants and, and there may be space available. Um, if not, we'll see you back here at, at uh, 2.30 for the panel on religious perspectives and teachings on migration and national identity. Thank you so much for, your, uh, for being here and for your attention.